Leakage in Windows. So what does leakage mean? Well, we'll define it as when the spectral content of your signal does not correspond to a spectral line that you have available in your analysis. Let's go back to Pete's 1 hertz delta F, right? He's got 1 hertz delta F. He thinks this is going to get him out of all his problems. Well, bad news is he's going to be trying to measure a couple different signals. The first one's going to come out pretty easily. He's got a 5 volt sine wave at 3 hertz. He's got a spectral line right at 3 hertz, and so this is going to be his frequency spectrum, right? Typically, we like five to connect volts. these uh, answers with straight lines, and so we would get 5 volts right at 3 hertz, and this would be perfect, right? No leakage here. What if I then told Pete with his 1 hertz delta F to go measure a 2.5 hertz sine wave? What is he going to do? Well, we don't have a spectral line at 2.5 hertz, right? Yeah, we don't, so it just disappears, right? No, it's going to get nicely, evenly divided between the 2 and the 3, right? And so we're always going to know that it was exactly 2.5 because these are exactly half, right? Uh, wouldn't that be like 2.5 at each, at 2 and 3? It's not quite right. Yeah. Ultimately, it's it's not what happens. When we have this leakage, we don't just get a nice, easily uh, solved problem. What we end up with is spectral energy leaking across all spectral lines of our frequency spectrum. And we cannot figure wow. out what the frequency content was. Okay, so we need to avoid leakage at all costs. It doesn't disappear and it doesn't just go into the adjacent spectral lines. It goes everywhere across the frequency range. That's, That's right. wild. Yep. Let's say uh, why this is. Okay, so the spectral energy leaks across all spectral lines. That's why we call it leakage. And so what does this look like in the real world? Well, uh, the red uh, trace here is a perfectly sampled and uh, performed frequency spectrum. You see a nice round 1.0 amplitude. This blue trace is where we sampled the same data, but not in a periodic manner. And so we get this leakage across all frequency lines and a reduction in the amplitude. Okay. So this is the, the effect of leakage in a real signal. So why does this happen? Well, if we've got a periodic signal, right, this signal sine wave repeats over and over. And if we do this exactly right, and we measure our capital T observation time, you know, right at the peak of the sine wave, right to the next peak in the sine wave, and we push stop real accurately, we end up with this as our sample for this continuous sample or signal, right? I then take that and reconstruct the original signal using that sample, and I end up with this. So I'll ask you, Pete, is the bottom signal the same as the original signal? At least over the area where you repeated it, it looks the same. I yeah. guess if you kept sending that out, it would, would keep looking the same, yeah? Yeah, my sample is an accurate piece of the, the full signal when I reproduce it. Now, in an aperiodic sampling scenario, I push stop a little bit too late. I was trying to hit this peak value right here, and I, I didn't get it, and I don't stop my measurement until this point now. So now this is my sample, and I take these samples, and I line them up end to end, and I recreate an, an additional from my original signal. And this is what I would get, right? So are these two signals the same between top and bottom? These, I can say, definitely aren't. Right. We get this huge discontinuity here, right? Where it jumps yeah. very, very quickly from this low amplitude up to the top. And we talked about these sharp edges in the time domain end up being very broad or tons of frequency content in the frequency domain. And so what we'll end up with is this leakage across all these frequency lines, okay? So what do we do to try to mitigate these effects? Well, we're going to multiply by something called a window. Okay, so even if we sampled aperiodically, we go with our worst case scenario. If I do a multiplication by this thing called a window, that is a function that starts at zero, ends at zero, and goes up to a, a value of one, if I multiply the blue times the purple window, I'll end up with this windowed signal. And if I take that windowed signal, and recreate my original signal from that, it's at least continuous, right? I don't have any of those sharp discontinuities in my signal anymore. And so I'm going to minimize the amount of leakage that I have, right? I don't have any sharp edges in this trace, right, Pete? Yeah, there's no sharp edges, but it doesn't 
quite look like the original, so, but it's somewhat usable. What, what ends up happening here? Yeah. So the window forces our signal to be periodic by making it zero at the beginning and the end. We don't have this impulse or this sharp edge in our signal. But as we're going to see, we have a reduced energy and a reduced amplitude in our windowed signal. Okay, so we're going to apply these windows and they're going to each have a different sort of application for us. But they're all there to help us minimize leakage. This guy is called the Hanning window. It's kind of the one we used in our example. Nice bell-shaped curve, sort of generic purpose window. There's also one called the flat top, which is really good at maintaining amplitude accuracy, and so it's often used for calibration. Then there's something called the uniform window, which is essentially a value of one for the whole observation time. So it's you're applying a uniform window if you don't apply a window, right? It's, the effect is exactly the same. And so you'd apply a uniform window when you know your, your signal is going to be zero at the beginning and zero at the end, again, in an impact testing sort of scenario, okay? Some other types of windows you can use. Force window, again, impact testing where we have an impact hammer. We are really interested in this impulsive part of our force, maybe us setting down the hammer. We don't want to have any of this little noise on there. And so a force window is essentially one during the impulse event and then off for the rest of it, and we end up with this nice, clean impact event and then no signal noise. It's going to help us get a nice leakage-free impact signal. And it's often paired with an exponential window, which we'll use to force a signal that's still oscillating by the time we come to our end of our observation window. We're just going to sort of artificially damp that vibration out so it's zero at the beginning and zero by the end. Okay, And this exponential decay artificially add some damping, but we know what we're applying, we can back that out. Now these windows all have side effects. There will be some frequency smearing, there will be some amplitude loss, as we saw. And so this handing window is sort of a nice balance between noise smearing, or I'm sorry, uh, frequency smearing and amplitude error. Whereas this flat top window we talked about, it has pretty bad frequency smearing, so this flat top is shown here but its amplitude error is very, very, very small. Okay, so we use a flat top for things like calibration where we don't, we know the frequency is gonna be what we're sending it through our calibrator and we wanna make sure our amplitude is very, very accurate. And so we sacrifice frequency smearing for amplitude. But as Pete said, this is our original signal. We're gonna window it and this is our window signal. This guy in red does not look like the original signal, right? It's reduced in amplitude and energy distribution between the top and the bottom, and so we have to account for this. The nice thing about these effects for a given window is that we can account for them in a display. Okay, So our perfectly sampled sine wave is shown in blue here. I use a Hanning window to create the red spectrum, and we see the amplitude is definitely reduced. The energy is distorted as well but we don't have as much leakage as we would if we had not used a window at all. So we have a lower amplitude and our energy contents distorted a little bit. The nice thing about these windows is the amplitude correction and the energy correction are known values because we knew what the window functions were going in, we can calculate the effects on amplitude and energy, and so we can counteract that. Okay, so for our handing window example, we see our amplitude correction is two. So you see our amplitude is exactly half. So if I want to correct for that, I just multiply my amplitude by two and boom, I've got my amplitude perfectly corrected. You notice my energy is still not quite exactly right. It should be looking like the blue. So now let's do an energy correction. Energy correction is 1.63. And so I can correct for the energy as well. So here the energy or the area under the blue curve is identical to the area under the red curve. You see I had to bring this amplitude down a little bit in order to correct that energy error. The only bad thing about window corrections is that they cannot be both applied at the same time. We can correct either the amplitude or the energy and it's really left up to us as an engineer or the tester to make this decision and apply one of these corrections. Okay.